What's up, Fromies? Welcome back to the First Rounds on Me podcast. Tonight's guest is Sabrina Zohar. Sabrina is an entrepreneur and the founder of Software and the Do the Work podcast. Uh, she's all about inspiring others to go after their dreams and embrace their vulnerability. Sabrina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Sabrina, so I want to start with how did you get into like the coaching part and what exactly do you coach? Because I didn't know that about you until recently. Yeah. So that's actually something I kind of did under the table for like six months of the year last year, just because I, so I own a clothing company called Software and being an entrepreneur, as we all know, is like incredibly taxing and difficult. And so for me, the dating world was something that I didn't really have an outlet for. And so I started just like talking to friends and then that grew into some people being like, Hey, would you coach me and, and it, give me advice? And I was like, cool. Like I just, I never entertained that as something that I would actually do as like a profession or charge people for. And it just mushroomed in and of itself. And it gave me a creative outlet outside of my company to do something else. Because as an entrepreneur, you're always looking for the next <laughs> thing that you're going to do. So why not add more to my plate? Yeah. And so now it's been like a year I've been coaching with clients and I take like very few because I have so many other things that are in the works now for this year. Um, but it's been really fun being able to do that. So how does it work? Like not like the logistics, but like, what do you usually, how do you start with a client? So typically I don't really, I have like maybe 10 clients that are recurring, but a lot of the clients that I work with now are really just like, it's more situation based. It's like they're struggling with dating or something's not right or something they, they, they know that there's something off and they can't really identify it. And then that's where they ask me to come in. So usually now what I've been doing is a lot of sessions with people where it's like yesterday I had this awesome dude. He was super cool. And he just kind of shared with me his situation that he had with this girl. And we were just like working through it and trying to challenge his thoughts because he was getting a little too comfortable in I don't understand and I'm not sure. And it was just kind of, he was ruminating in the same thoughts and I kind of step in and I'm like, okay, let's like dissect this. I am not a therapist. So by no means is it like, let's talk about your traumas and let's go into childhood shit. It's more like if I see that, that's when I'll tell them like, it's time for you to maybe go to somebody else. But it's really just like, I'm the older sister that I think a lot of people don't have. Like I very much tell it like it is New York, as <laughs> we know. Um, and so I'm really there because like, if you look at the TikTok and the videos that I create and the content that goes around it and working with the clients, it's really like straightforward, no bullshit. Like this is what you, this is what nobody's fucking telling you. And that's where I step in. So I think people appreciate that because it kind of like slaps them in the face and gives them that awareness and reality to things that I don't think they were really accustomed to. Yeah. And we were just talking about like how after a date, right, you don't necessarily get honest feedback. Yeah. So I feel like for, you know, you stepping in it's refreshing and it's helpful. It's actually helpful stuff that they can use and put into play for the future. I try. I mean, it's always hard because it's like, you know, you're only the stories that I'm getting from somebody. I'm, like, I'm getting one side of a story. I'm getting their perception of it. I, I wasn't there. I don't actually know what happened. So it's like I'm trying to. But for the most part, I think the people that come to me are ready for the tough love. They're not as resilient. Like I've definitely worked with a couple of people that want to fight me. And those are the ones that I'm like, I just don't deal with that. Mm. We're not here for that. Um, but it's been really interesting just to see different people's experiences, perspectives. And then when you start to kind of piece together the patterns that they have, mm -hmm. watching them have the awareness is actually the most exciting part for me because you see that the light bulb goes on and you're like, I could have one sentence that something might be so simple to everybody else literally just changed the way that person sees things moving forward. And that's the exciting part of this. Yeah. But, but how long do you think it takes for that light bulb to come on? Because I feel like everybody's blinded by... Yeah what they want, right? Like you could have someone telling you, hey, this is a scenario and in your head, you're like, that's very obviously not gonna work for you, you should run. But to them, they actually think it is gonna work and they find that one angle of, but what about this scenario? Like that one off 1% 1 scenario that they hold on to. And like, at what stage do you feel you see people actually get the light bulb? I think it depends on their journey with their self-discovery. That's like a big part of it. If it's somebody that has done no work on themselves, they've never mm -hmm. been to therapy, they just even learned what anxious was or avoidant or all of those fucking buzzwords that are kind of nulling around, everyone's calling everyone a narcissist. So I think there's, if you're kind of in that part of the spectrum, a lot of the things I say are these come to Jesus moments because you're like, oh my God, I've never thought of it like that. And it's just such an awareness that they have never even had. I think somebody that's a little bit further along the way, they're more receptive and like spongy. So it takes usually like yesterday, it took almost at the end of our session. Like I could see that he was kind of doing that same where he was getting it, but he was writing notes. And then I was just one sentence that I framed for him in a different way that I could see it. Sometimes you have a session and it doesn't happen and then it'll take like a few and then they'll kind of have that moment. But I think there's a level of 
of understanding, at least when I'm dealing with people that however old you are, all of us in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and there on, that is all of those years prior that you've had that thought process. Mm -hmm. So you are undoing 30 to 60 years worth of the same thought process. And that's really scary for people to let go of because then they have to start reframing everything in their life if that thought process has changed. So I think it's dependent upon how sick and tired of being sick and tired of these people are. And it could range from the first thing I say is all of a sudden this groundbreaking revelation that I I said hi, or it could be like closer to the end of one, two, or three sessions where you start to really chip away because that person actually like wants to welcome in some of that more, like more of the feedback. Yeah. And so what got you started on this journey? Like both, maybe let's go personally first. Was there like an aha moment or did you kind of gradually start getting into the stuff and then get good at it and really understand it? And that's how you start helping people. Like how did you first... I it came from my rock bottom. Mm. So like, at least for me, so this is 2016 was like, I was a pack a day smoker. I was on anti-anxiety, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, like didn't work out. I was like 40 pounds heavier than I am now. I was just the shittiest version of myself and working in fashion in a job I fucking hated. And I broke up with my net, like, this guy that was great, which wasn't for me, broke up with him one minute and completely detoxed everything that cold turkey and like changed my entire life. That started this like, okay, health and wellness, mental health, like this is all really important. Started meditating. Then my mom got sick and that was like how software started, this whole thing. I was in a very serious relationship and it wasn't until he actually broke up with me that I hit complete rock bottom and that started therapy for me. So it was 2018. So it was like 2016 to 2018, I was still... Meant, uh, physically, I was getting better and stronger, but mentally, I wasn't taking care of that. And then, I'm sorry, 2019, it was like December 2018 into 2019, I started therapy. And that's when I started understanding like, oh, I dated my father. Cool. <laughs> I was going after like textbook Freudian shit, dating the, the same version that I had seen all of my life. And I think it was in that I felt so alone that like nobody understood what I was going through. I was the crazy one. Nobody got what like, anxiety was doing and daddy issues and all of that. And then I have really put the fucking work in. And over the course of like those, what now or four years later, I started to understand like I wasn't alone. More people were having these issues. And then I was actually able to take what my therapist is saying, make it into a bite-sized tangible like edible point. And then somebody layman's that has never been into therapy. It's like, okay, this is what they're trying to say and be able to like give it in a, in a more like bite-sized version, I guess. Yeah. I'm like stumbling mm -hmm. on that, but I was able to find a way to take something that is a little bit more complicated and feed it into the masses so that they can understand it. And then that's really where I started to realize like, oh shit, I think I have something here that I can help people with. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. And I feel like uh, social media doesn't do it justice either because we all see like the best version of everybody and we think, oh, like they have it figured out. Yeah. And then why don't I have it figured out? And it, it adds that layer of anxiety and stress. And I think if everybody was honest and open with their struggles and like talk, it would make everybody else feel better because literally every single person in this world has some type of struggle and maybe some are bigger than others and some people deal with it better, but it's like having that communication to then that understanding of saying like, Hey, you're not alone. Yeah. Whereas maybe a couple of years ago, you're like, why? Like how come I got dealt this fucking card? Like why didn't anybody else get dealt this card when a lot of people get dealt this unique it's terrible side of everything, you know? Totally. I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing about social media. It's such a double-edged sword. It connects so many people and it makes you feel less alone, but it also alienates so many people and makes you feel like you're inferior and you can't attain those things. So I think it's like used correctly. It's such right. a beautiful tool. Um, but I mean, I've definitely noticed, especially in the world, like TikTok was new for me. I was like an Instagram girl. I didn't really like fuck mm -hmm. with anything else. Getting into that land of things has made me realize like there's a lot of really, really unhappy, miserable fucking people out there that don't want to get help, that just want to live in their misery. And so it's weeding through that to find. And then there's a lot of toxic shit. Like I'm sure you guys. I would say <laughs> the the people who comment on our stuff the most comment the nastiest stuff mm -hmm. and they just do it to be nasty. And like, yeah. you know, you'll see other things they comment on that are so different than us. And it's just nasty after nasty. And you kind of have to take a step away from that because if you feed into the, their nastiness, yeah. that's what they want. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, hey, I'm I'm miserable. I want to bring you down for you to be miserable. And it's just terrible. But back to what you said about the beauty of, you know, Instagram as well, if it's done in the right way, I feel like that's dating apps as well, right? Like yeah. if a dating app is done in the right way, even any dating app, and like, you're on there to actually meet somebody and everybody's on there for the right reason, yeah. that's beautiful because you have all these people to possibly connect with. 
but it's the same thing. People are on there for nasty reasons or, you know, wasting time. And it's like if people harnessed technology in the right way, yeah. it would be so beautiful. Well, I heard a quote the other day and it was like expectations are just unmet needs. And I was like, oh, fuck, that totally adds up because so many people, their expectations of a dating app are completely unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Like, let's call a spade a spade. It is an inorganic amount of people that you could meet in one place that are all single and of the opposite sex or whatever you're looking for, same sex, it doesn't really matter, in one little tiny tablet. You would never meet that many people in a day or a month or even sometimes a year. And so I think a lot of people, like when you're getting onto a dating app, it's okay to be excited and to want to something, but I think it's also this like this expectation that every single person that I meet on this app has to want a relationship with me and has to want to be with me. Right. And they can't differentiate the fact that they're like, or people have different dating needs. Some yeah. people are just getting back into it and trying to figure it out. Some people are very intentional on a relationship. Some people just want companionship. So I think it's like both sides of the coin. It's how it's used. And then it's also like the expectations of the user that are going on them because it's, it's like going into the world and thinking everyone's nice. You're like, oh, you'll find out quickly that's not the case. Yeah, and I think, I think everybody on a dating app expects the person that they match with to be their husband or that's wife. That's it. And, and yep. I think that's so terrible. Instead of just going on a first date with somebody and being so open to like, hey, I have zero expectation here. I just want to have a good time with this person, enjoy their energy, get to know them, get to know what they're about. And if it's, if it's great, let's do a second date. But I think men and women go into this first date of like, this is it. This yeah. is my person. And then they're quickly shut down because just statistically it's not going to happen. No. And then they're just so depressed and underwhelmed with everything. Not to mention too, if you enter with that anxiety, if you step into it, we're like, oh, you got, you're two dudes. I'm sure you can tell me very easily that when you see a girl where you're like, whoa, it seems like she like needs me or she, it like her happiness is dependent upon if I ask her out or if I text her, or if I'm doing that, that's a lot of pressure to put onto somebody else to fulfill your own needs. Because that's like usually what I like the number one thing I kind of drill into people's heads. I'm like, don't you can't go into the dating world expecting that that person is going to heal you or fix anything, because that is why people get into relationships and are fucking miserable still, right. because it's your own stuff that you need to figure out. It's that inner child or wherever. Trauma is not trauma doesn't necessarily mean if you had a traumatic experience that it had to have been somebody hitting you or somebody abusing you. Trauma is a perception of an experience. So if that left a mark on you, like it could have even been oh yeah, my dad just didn't pay attention to us when you were kids and he was there. He was always there, but he wasn't present. That could be traumatic as a child. Your needs went unmet as an adult now. You're seeking every man that you meet or vice versa to fulfill that need. And then right. it's like this first date, it's this crumble if it doesn't work out or like I got ghosted after the first date. I'm like, no, that person just didn't want to have a life with you, which is totally normal and okay. Yeah, and I think uh, to that point as well, People hone in on the one negative, right? Oh, yeah. Like you can go on a date with a guy or a woman and they're just so amazing. But there's like that one thing like, oh, he, uh, you know, he's not taller than me or yeah. he didn't open the car door for me. And it's like, yeah, maybe ideally you wouldn't want the car door, right? Maybe like, hey, in a perfect world, I'd want him to open the car door for me. But because he didn't do that, now I'm stuck on that one negative thing instead yeah. of being like, Oh, he's having great conversation. He cares about me. He's asking all the right questions. He's paying for my drink. That's beautiful. I think we hone in on negative things for some reason. Oh my God, don't even start with me. It's like with the texting thing. The texting in the dating world is the bane of my existence half the time because it's usually what I deal with with most of my clients. And it's like texting is not an indication of someone's fucking interest in you or their the, what their intentions are with you. Yeah. Just because I have had it so many times, just because a dude texts you morning, noon, and night, that guy may have zero interest in being your boyfriend. Yeah. He's just on his phone or he's saying vice versa is just because someone doesn't text you all the fucking time or you don't get your good morning text you don't get your good night test like first of all you don't know this person you've gone on two dates with them and you expect them to now make you part of their life the pinch doesn't match the ouch the amount of time you've known this person doesn't match the amount of attention that you want from this person yeah so it's like people get stuck on that one thing and i'll always ask like what else are they doing well yeah i mean he asks me on dates and i'm like how often like three times a week i'm like i'm sorry this guy is asking you out consistently he's awesome the sex is great everything is great but because he's not fucking texting you every single day and you can't challenge your own anxiety and sit in discomfort you want to end it with this person because nobody wants like it's a big thing of we're like the google generation we need certainty and i can't like i can't fathom going on a first date if i don't know i'll have like seven more because i don't want to get attached and it's <laughs> like 
So it's all the pendulum swings. You're like either all or nothing. And it's been really interesting to see that like it's trying to get people to break because there's that perception of options. You don't actually have that many fucking options. And I think that I think people think they do. They do. People think uh, even on apps or in real life. Oh, I don't want to commit to this person because I might walk across the street and I might meet like Angelina Jolie. It's Mm -hmm. like (laughs) You're okay. like you, and I could win the lottery. It's yeah. like, but I'm not banking my fucking life savings on this. Exactly. Yeah. So, interesting world we live in. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to talk more about that you mentioned earlier because I I think that like people let like literal memes run their life, right? And yeah. talking about like the word toxic and mm. gaslighting and men are trash, all this shit that gets like blasted into people's faces constantly, I think fucks up so many relationships, yeah. so many people. And I think people see like a meme where it's like, oh, drop that person out of your life. And they will literally take that advice and just put it into play. Do you see that like a lot with people you talk to or in, in your experience of like coming to you with like these little like snippets they hear and letting it change their entire mindset about something? So the number one things I hear, if he wanted to, he would, which drives me up a fucking wall. Cause what it is, it? if he wanted to, he would. Oh yeah. It is one of the, my like least favorite sayings. Um, I used to be of the school of thought of that. Like I used to be in that, like, well, if he really wants you, he will. And it's like, oh, that completely discredits what bandwidth that like people are dealing with their own shit. There's no compassion in that sentence. Um, if he likes you, you know, if not, you'll be confused. And it's like, no, dating's confusing. Even when a guy tells me he likes me, it's still confusing. Cause mm-hmm. you're like, but in what context? Like, it, yeah. So I think there are a lot of those like buzzy, everyone's a narcissist. Yes, All of a sudden, everybody yeah. is a fucking psychologist and psychiatrist. What are the words can, that I hate? Um, oh, gas, I hate gaslighting. Gaslighting. And uh, there's another one. It's but, which are very, these are like, they're, and they're, the, the problem is, is that they're very real things. Like gaslighting is in fact a form of manipulation. And like, it is something that people do. I've had it done to me, but it doesn't mean, or like the ghosting. Everybody is ghosting. I'm like, what was the situation? Well, he just never texts me after the date. I'm like, that's not ghosting yeah i think ghosting like we always get the question of ghosting right like yeah. how do you feel about ghosting and i'm like well how many dates did you go on what, what was the context right yeah. if, if i went on one date with you and then you never texted me and i ever texted you that's not that's, ghosting. yeah or like if i faded away and it was one date it's like i would r- much rather that than after one day you being like hey listen you're a great person but i don't see a future with you and you know i'm probably never going to speak to you again i'd be like okay, I felt the same way about you. Why did you feel the need to like thoroughly, formally give me that direction? Because it's just weird. Well, people think that they're a lot easier to talk to than they are. Mm -hmm. And that's what I noticed. I'm like, okay, so let me ask you. If someone really came to you right now and was like, Joe, I really, I hated your fucking pants that you wore and I thought you were stupid. You would be so upset. Not to say anyone would ever say that about you. You'd be (laughs) so upset instead of someone just not texting you back or you're like, all right, I deduced that you weren't into me. And people are like, why can't he just tell me? Why can't he just tell me? It's like your mind is trying to piece together something that doesn't necessarily need an answer to. You don't need the closure. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's funny though? I think think that some people do, some people don't, right? And I think think that like – it's funny because we talked about you talked about opening the car door, right? And we had a, we had a uh, girl on the other day, Alexa, and we were talking to to Alexa about like if you pick someone up for a first date, like she asked us, she's like, if you guys pick someone up for a first date, would you get out of the car when you get to their house? And I said yes, and he said no, it'd be weird. And Alexa, well, I said I didn't know. I said I, I would have to see how the situation played out, but I, I I honestly don't know. Okay, and then Alexa said it would be creepy. And then she goes, wait, unless I like the person, then it'd be then it'd be sweet. And so I was like, you don't fucking, no you one fucking know. Knows. And half the time people want answers, they want closure. So it's like, I think you just have to stop taking things personally. Not you, but well, me, yeah. everyone. Don't think, try not to take things personally and and just kind of roll with it. And every situation is different. Every person is different. And I think the more you can kind of realize that and not, because it, it kind of goes back to expectations too. So the more you can kind of just like roll with what happens and not let it like, affect you and and hold on to it the better the better off you'll be yeah i think it goes back to something we said earlier about if someone texts you too soon or not often plays a game i think that there's no game but i think it's sexy if someone's busy right yeah like, that's really hot if you have your own life and you're busy and you you touch base here and there during the yeah. day that's so sexy and it's not like oh you have to wait three days to text somebody or like no, i think yeah. that's an extreme or if if i text somebody and they answer every like every second right away. I wouldn't be just I wouldn't be turned off that they answer. I'd just be like, "Why aren't you a little busy?" Yeah. You know, like, do like, you do anything <laughs> outside of? I'd just be confused. Me. I'd just be like, "Okay." Well, it's like I don't know. I just 
it really, I think what a lot of people, the reason that especially with the texting thing is such a thing is, is it really does come down to like, when you start to piece it, when you start to pull back the layers and really understand like, okay, why do you want someone to text you? It's like, you want the validation. You want to feel that you're not going to be abandoned. You want to have some kind of like guarantee that that person's still showing up because your anxiety is so severe that sitting in any kind of discomfort and feeling like, cause it's like, what makes somebody anxious, avoidant or secure at the end of the day to really get to security is understanding that you're going to be okay no matter what and feeling okay that you're going to be fine if that person doesn't respond to you. It's not that your entire fucking world is going to crumble. And yeah. I get that. It's like, I'm gutted. Oh my God, this guy, we went on two dates and then I did, and then he stopped texting or the texting changed. And it's like, well, because you created a false sense of intimacy by texting somebody incessantly before you fucking met them for, we've all been there. We have all been there. Every person has had that one person that you text for like a week before you meet, sometimes longer. And then you meet and it's like either they're not that great or you don't feel it or whatever, or one of the two people doesn't jive and then it always goes down. That is because you've projected a version of what you want that person to be onto them. It's not the actual fucking person. If that were the person, you guys would be in a happy relationship. But you don't know somebody or like, oh, I was dating this guy three dates and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, who, who is that three dates? <laughs> I don't know someone after six months, I still don't even know their routine half the time, but three dates, do you think that I'm going to let you know about all my childhood traumas in the first fucking month? <laughs> like, just wait, keep getting to know me. <laughs> so it's like, I think there's that, that like just immediacy. We're such a, like, I want immediacy. I want to fill that void and I want to find my partner and I don't want to do this anymore because the thought at the end of the day of being alone is terrifying and it reinstigates those core beliefs that if somebody isn't choosing you, you're not good enough. Yeah, and I think what you said about the the response of just feeling that validation, like that person didn't run away, that that is so important to some people, which is, I think it's terrible, right? Because yeah. why do you need to feel that validation, that security of someone you just met? And then you kind of just said, what we talk about the app all the time of people text for this long period of time before they meet. And I get it, right? Like I get, especially women in the world, are like I want to vet somebody before I meet them in real life. Yeah. And I understand that. But if you really think about it, like if you actually want to meet somebody and connect with them, the longer you keep that conversation on that phone, the more you're setting yourself up for failure. Just oh, because, yeah. like you said, you're always going to create the best version of that person. And we see all the time with someone will say, oh, this guy's so funny. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, tell me. I'm like, why? Yeah. Oh, like the, all these jokes he's telling me online. And like my response is very obvious. It's just like I could Google the funniest joke of all time and just regurgitate them to, to you through text. And then when I meet you, I'm, maybe I am really funny, but I'm not as funny as you thought I was. And you're just going to be like, oh, I thought you were super funny, but you're just kind of funny. And yeah, I don't like a you. vibe. There's yeah. a vibe that happens when two people meet. That's why. And I was like, Jay Shetty explained the spark so perfectly this morning in his video. And I was like, oh, my God, it all connected scientifically like this has actually been researched that when you feel the spark it's a mix of excitement and stress so you have the excitement of you see somebody when you're walking down the street or at Erewhon why not <laughs> give the shameless plug and you're like that person's really attractive and then you have like that's the excitement and then the stress comes in oh but wait do they like me and that is why the spark is such a dangerous thing because it's built with excitement and stress at the same time but then as you start to progress and it's like well how that manifests well depending on your um, attachment style, you'll then see how you act on that spark. Right. Are you going to let that oftentimes it's like you get the spark. You're like, yeah, cause that person's a fucking narcissist. And that was really reminiscent. They were very charming and it reminded you of somebody in your past. And that's why you're enamored by them. But a lot of people that I always hear is the, like, I didn't feel the spark or the spark. I, I lost the spark. And it's like, no, what happened is your central nervous system was really fucking relaxed, which is what it should be when you meet somebody. You shouldn't feel high or low. You should be very calm because healthy doesn't equal boring. Healthy is central, like a calm central nervous system. Yep. So when the spark fades, it's like, no, you got to know that person and you're no longer waiting on breath that's baited to see if they're going to text you or to see if they want to see you again. You know that they do. You're in a relationship now. The spark wasn't gone. You just now actually have comfort with somebody, which is what it's supposed to be. Exactly. And I, I don't know how much you do listen to him or don't listen to him, but he said something the other day about chemistry, right? And he said, uh, people always ask me, you know, I lost chemistry with my partner. You know, I shouldn't be with him anymore. And he was like, chemistry is going to go away. Yeah. Like that chemistry you feel is going to go away fairly quickly. And then you turn that chemistry into a connection and communication, right? And they're two totally different things. But if you think that you're going to have chemistry with everyone every day and every minute... Ugh it's impossible it's just if not only. real <laughs> are you kidding imagine if every time you're with somebody it felt like that first date with the butterflies and you're and it's like well 
then, but friendships aren't like nothing in life is like that. And if there's a difference, it's like, that's another thing you see on the Insta TikTok world of like, if it's not easy, don't do it. And mm-hmm. it's like, mm, owning a business isn't easy, but I still do it. Being in a relationship by no means is fucking easy. It's a lot of work, but I still do it. It should flow. But like, if you're having where if somebody or like, you know, oh, is he this or is he this? It's like at the end of the day, if your needs aren't being met, who gives a shit about somebody else? Stop focusing right. on is that guy avoided or is he just not into me? Or maybe as a girlfriend, it's like, well, but are your needs being met? They're not cool. So it's all a moot point, right? Yeah. Yeah. The guy be, can be from fucking Mars. It doesn't matter. The guy's not, if, if you're not having your needs met, I don't care what's wrong with him. Stop focusing on everybody else. And that's trying to per, like to deflect. Oh, I don't have to do any of the work on myself if I just focus on everybody else because that's the problem. Yeah. And we always talk about this, how like the movies portray the perfect version <sighs> of love, right? Disney. And <laughs> Disney, everything. And, you know, when I got into a relationship, I, I grew so fast so quickly mm-hmm. because I thought if I fight with you, you're not my person, yeah. right? Like- we shouldn't fight. Like that. It should be easy and free flowing. We should be happy every second. And then I realized, like, no, I really love this person, and I have to be more open to communicating better. Mm-hmm. And you know, women and men speak different languages. I need to be a little more attentive and ask the right questions. And I can't just say, "Oh, you're fighting with me for no reason. You're not my person. Goodbye. Fuck you. Right. I'm going to go find somebody else." Perception of options of like, <laughs> "Oh, I'll just get someone else," and it's like. Or yeah, it's like, or the Disney movie where I'm like, there's no fucking knight that's going to come up a castle and save you. Unfortunately, <laughs> I thought that for years. And I remember my sister's husband always saying, he's like, you want someone to save you so bad from the shit that you dealt with as kids that you don't want to do the work yourself. And that was that awareness that I needed to have of like, holy shit, no one else can do this besides me. Because if you can't sit in solitude, not sit alone on your phone or sit alone at home watching TV, if you can't sit just by yourself, which is really hard to do, how do you expect that you can sit with other people and feel fulfilled? Yeah. And that's another thing that he explains. He explains everything, but he yeah. explains loneliness for a solitude, right? Like yeah. Just because you're not in a relationship, you might not be lonely. You just no. are enjoying solitude and that's great. But, you know, <laughs> you're yeah, like, like What's up? solitude's great. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's great. Loneliness is not. But if you're single and you're like, I actually am loving every second of being alone and being by myself, you're in solitude. That's amazing. And I think people don't understand Solitude and loneliness. It's just a big mishmash. It's kind of a misconception. Yeah. yeah. I, and there's also like the stigma, the social stigmas. And it's like, I think us as a generation, there's something that we also need to remember. This is all new. Our parents didn't have online dating. They didn't have texting. They didn't have any of this shit. They didn't have the accessibility to all of this. We're now what? Texting? I thought about it. I was like, well, it's maybe 15 years old. 15, 16 yeah. years ago, like I, when I was in high school, I'm aging myself right now. <laughs> but when I was in high school, that's when it started to happen where you got your little Nokia fucking brick phone and you could text LOL, which my mom thought meant lots of love. I think and, you only got like 10 texts per month or right, something. Right, you had like a certain <laughs> amount. So you had to still call people and you had, or you had AIM. We started this entire generation of technology and dating and all of that. So there's no wonder that none of us have any idea what the fuck the rules are. But our parents started the generation of, I'm not gonna stay in something that doesn't fulfill me or make me happy so that's why divorces that rate started so heavily and then now we're seeing it as like dudes in their 40s and 50s that are like you know just haven't found the right one and it's like yeah because you don't want to look at yourself i think that's i think that's so spot on especially here in la you see all these i mean and and i don't like to judge people but you know you see a lot of these guys in their 50s even their 60s that you know like hang around you know at all of our events and they're saying they're looking for something, right? But then I see them going up to like a 22-year-old and like, yeah. they're like, oh, she doesn't like me. And they actually want to date the 22-year-old. I'm like, like, you're living in a different world. Like, what do you have in common with this 22-year-old? What? How are you going to grow with her? She Does she want to be with you? No. like. Well, it's because they know a 22-year-old's never going to call them on their shit. <laughs> a 22-year-old has no idea how to even do that. She hasn't lived long enough. Like, I had somebody who... She reached out to me. She was like 20 and she's like, oh, the guy I'm dating is 35. And the way she was describing this guy, I was like, I would, I never tell any single person I work with or talk to what to do. That's not my job. I'll ask you questions so that you can figure out what you need to do. Mm -hmm. But I am not here to be like, break up with that person. This was the first time I had to be like, you need to fucking break up with this person. I was like, because he's 35, you're 20. The stuff that this man was pulling, I was like, this poor girl has no idea that that is not healthy. Who knows what she was raised to think was. Right. And you think of like with all this toxic shit of like, well, if you really love somebody and you'll make it work and all this. And it's like, "Mm, not like that. Right. And usually the older dudes that go for the younger girls, it's like, 
they don't want, they know that they can waste her time and it's not really wasting it. They know it's an experience, but they also know that that girl is never going to make them have to step up to a, a, a specific place. It's like the Andrew Tates of the world. I love the step up. I think the step up's the sexiest thing. When you meet somebody so hot. who's like, I am not taking your shit. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be with me, this is how you have to act. So hot. And it's not like an ultimatum. It's like, no. like listen, you're Boundary. great, but this is who I am and this is what I expect. And then it, like you lift each other up. I think that's so sexy. Yeah. I will say, though, and going back to the meme world, I feel like <laughs> that's a problem, too, because people are like, I'm a fucking queen. Like, I oh, deserve yeah. to shut the fuck up. You yeah, are, the princess yeah, treatment. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, that, I mean, you could just tell, like, for me, that's like an instant, like, okay, this person is not, obviously not for me, but like, right. they have, you know, um, issues that they haven't dealt with. But I right. hate that, like, I'm a queen. I deserve this. I d- it's like, no, you're not. You're just a normal person. And I don't know. I don't even want to get into that. You but deserve to be treated well. Right, of course. You deserve to be treated well. But like also what I always tell them, like people be like, I took your advice and the guy stopped talking to me. I'm like, that's the best thing that could yeah. happen though. I'm like, that person just saved you months of bullshit. Yeah. Because by remaining true to yourself, what you do, your pool, your pool gets smaller. But the people in that pool are so much more worth your time. Unless the person is completely oblivious and they well, think yeah. they're a literal queen. Because that happens a lot. <laughs> like, no, that happens a lot. the queen thing. No, the queen, whatever you want to call yeah. it. But like, it's people, people think they have no flaws. Right. And totally. again, when I say people, I'm myself included. Like, <laughs> I'm not preaching and people but a lot there's people out there think they have no flaws and they don't need to do anything they don't yeah. need to fix themselves and they're just like just waiting for someone to give them everything yeah serious self-awareness lack. so i have to jump yeah let's do a shameless before i have to go a non-shameless plug i have to just say oh yeah jay um, shetty so and erwan but wait I, you are a self-proclaimed slut oh for the for cloud movie. oh i fucking love the cloud. <laughs> are you kidding yeah this was my number one. So this crush. is the only reason you came back to LA mm-hmm. probably is to get this um, yeah. i will be back maybe but sabrina it was a pleasure talking to you like and I would say, you're amazing. I would, I mean, I would love to do this again because we have so much to talk about. Can I ask you guys one quick question yes. before you leave for any of the girls that are watching slash that will? Do you believe as two man, man, male, whatever, two dudes, the box theory, that when you meet a girl within the first 10 minutes, you know if you want to date her, fuck her, or never see her again? Uh, No. Thank you. Wait, so in the first 10 minutes, you know? Within the, you- the whole thing now is that within the first 10 minutes of meeting, a guy already knows what he wants with you. And that after that, there's no point in getting to know him because he's already made his decision. I, that that's what he wants. I was so confused. So I'm engaged now. I was so confused. <laughs> well, I, when I met my now fiance, I was so confused for months about what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And we broke up and I was like, I have no idea what I want. <laughs> okay. Thank you for answering that. Cause I always thought that was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. We can talk more about it. And yes. he, uh, you might he's be going back. to, what are you going to Instagram live or something? I'm going to Instagram live. Oh, right fun. Here. We're so techie. We're such <laughs> millennials. You know, entrepreneurs. I know. All right. I'll be back. Ciao. Okay. Yeah, that, um, that, that's one point of contention for me of like, well, a guy will know and don't waste your time. It's like. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'm a huge like don't generalize person, right? Every situation is not black. Every situation has so many shades of gray and nuance and you really. But like, I mean, off the top of my head, I remember uh, meeting a friend of a friend, right? And we were going up to a, like a weekend away, like a bunch of people. And I met this person, didn't really think anything about her. Drove like three hours in the car. We all talked, spent like that first night together, spent the whole next day together. And then the next morning, I was like, holy shit, I like really like this person. And I didn't even think about her until yeah. like, you know what I mean? And like, so I mean, that's just one small example. I definitely don't believe in the in the box theory. Cause I also like to have like a strong friendship with somebody before yeah. things go, you know, really go any further. So that's, that's interesting. That's another question people ask often. Like there's just certain things that stick out often. And you're like, okay, that's the same question I keep seeing is like, should I start with friends? And I'm like, I don't think you should force that. I think if right. it's organic to start as a friend, I'm like, if you're meeting somebody on a dating app, I don't think you want to enter it being like, I just want to start as friends. And then maybe over time, it's like, you, you'd lose me as an intentional dater. But it's like, it's a, you should have a friend. It should be somebody that you feel, I always say, I'm like, would you want to be that person's friend if you weren't romantic with them? Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of dudes that you're like, Oh, actually, no, I wouldn't. It's like, yeah. Then why would you want to date them? Yeah, and I preach a lot about like uh, liking someone as as important as loving them, right? For a yeah. relationship, because a lot, like there's plenty of people that I love because I kind of have to, or they're you know family, like whatever it is. But like I don't necessarily like them, and I wouldn't choose to spend time with them. Yeah. But so like liking somebody is so important, and I think that goes back to you know the friendship and what you just said about would you want to be around that person if you weren't dating them. Yeah, just in life, it's like, if you can sit here and tell me yes, it's like, great, keep dating that person. But if the first answer you have is no, it's like, 
you want to fit a circle and through a square peg and I can feel that. Yeah. And that's, I think a lot of the times in the dating is it's, it's like, it's this force and that's why it feels inorganic because mm -hmm. it's like, you shouldn't be forcing a connection. It really should be two people that genuinely like want to explore the connection. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, thank you. A lot yeah. of rules, like there's rules, right? Like yeah. we, we went to see this woman, uh, this dating coach, uh, Amy Noble. She was great. She gave some, you know, very, uh, great advice and, I think helps a lot of people. She works one-on-one -on -one with people. Uh, but one of the things she said, she has a hard one hour max first date rule. Yeah. And I understand why that could be useful for certain, for certain people. But yeah, I was talking to somebody the other night that were like, we, like I interviewed them and they were like, yeah, we met, we had a 15 hour first date. Yeah. We've been together for three months and we're super happy. So like, I think guidelines can help you, but like, don't look at stuff as like right or wrong or black and white. And Feel out the situation. Oh, I mean, do we even want to then bring up the inf like the number one ruled thing that I get is like, so should I wait to sleep with a guy? Ro oh, I wanted to ask you about that too. Uh, I am personally not a firm believer in that. I, I'm very sex positive. So for me, I am always encouraging like, the reason I will tell you not to sleep with somebody is because are you going to be okay with it? Mm -hmm. If you have walking in no expectations and go, hey, if I never see that person again, I never see him. Every boyfriend I've ever had, we slept together on the first date. Really? Yeah. It was just, I'm, sex is a huge part of a relationship for me. It's huge. And otherwise I'm like, oh, you're just my friend then. So if we don't align sexually, like I'll talk about that on the first date of like, what are things that you like? How, how into this are you? And I've actually had it where I had a really amazing first date. We were driving for like five hours and we started talking about that. And I'm thinking, great, great. And then we left and we walked me home. And I remember texting him after we were texting a little and I was like, would you like to see each other again? And he said, I actually don't know that this is going to work. And I was like, what was it? He was like, it's the sex thing actually. And he's like, and I'm actually really happy you brought it up. He's like, to me, sex is not a big part of my relationship. He's like, I'm good with it. Like maybe once a week, maybe every two weeks. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's not me. Yeah. I was like, wow, well, thank you for not wasting my time. And I'm glad that we could get it out. I think there's a way you can speak about it appropriately and just talk about like, what are things you like? What are your kinks? What are you into? Like, I think it should be a safe space to explore and talk about that without it being like inappropriate and just like, okay, now I'm feeling like uncomfortable with this person. But I think if you want to explore somebody sexually and you are okay that if you never see them again, you're fine, do it. But don't not hook up with somebody because you think, oh, if I, like, there's this rule, don't kiss a guy for three months. And I'm like, are you off your fucking rocker? <laughs> well, three months. And I don't Who's know if rule we, is that? It's this one dating coach on TikTok that somebody tagged me and they're like, what do you think of this? And I was like, that is absurd. Three, three months. months for anything. Why are you putting such rules on a connection? It should be that you go with it. Obviously, like I said, if you're hooking up with people and it's hurting you, then stop doing that. Yeah. But if you're a grown ass adult that's like, yeah, I want to explore this person, don't wait. Because you tell me as a dude, this whole like, well, if I, I wait, he won't ghost me. It's like, in my opinion, I'm like, oh, he'll just do it after he's waited. That's not going to, yeah. that's not making somebody get into a relationship with you. Right. I, yeah, I agree. And it's funny because this goes back to everyone having their own, you know, thoughts about things and how they do things. So we always talk about Joe and Hannah. Hannah said, if she doesn't see a future or back in the day when she was single dating, if she didn't see a future of the person, but but was attracted to them, she would sleep with them on the first date. Yeah. Joe, she made wait till the second date, yeah, but, but it was still. because she liked him. So I'm kind of similar in, in the sense yeah. that like, if I like somebody, I, I kind of slow play because I'm like, oh, I don't want to like rush things. I want to feel it out. Um, but I think that's everyone's different and you shouldn't have these rules and you shouldn't have these no. expectations and it can only cause issues. So I, I say you just kind of roll with it and, and, you know, stay true to yourself and what yeah. you actually believe and feel. But don't listen to like all these different talking heads and trying to like, you know. Especially if it doesn't resonate. Like if you hear it and you're like, like for me, I'm like three months. Yeah. Wait, it's three months. Why would I do? Why are we playing a game? Yeah. Because you're trying. That's manipulation. You're trying to control the situation by saying, I'll, and I'm the same. Like if I see, if I'm seeing somebody and I like, you're like, I've had that where I'm like, I'm not probably never going to see this dude again. But I'm like, yeah, he's cute. I'll fuck him. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll have some fun. But. Even then it's like things change or like I could think I really like somebody and then you're physical and you're like, oh no, yeah. <laughs> absolutely not. This is not for me for whatever those reasons are. Like they could be into stuff that you're like, oh, that's, I'm just not into that. Why would you wait three months to figure that out? Because why would then I, why would I want to change someone's kinks and interests and things like that? Like if a dude wants to be pegged, hey, more power to you. I'm not going to be the one to do it. But I'd rather know that off the bat than wait three months and be like, I'm sorry, you want what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's good. I think it's good to talk about like, you know, don't force things on a first date. Yeah. But if stuff starts coming up naturally, I wouldn't, you know, you don't have to, 
because I think intimacy is is something that you should you know when you should share things when you're comfortable and you're ready. But I don't think you should hold back because it's a first date. Like if it comes up and you want to put something out there, I think the sooner you can get to know somebody, you don't have to know their whole life story. You don't have no. to know all their issues. But like the sooner you can actually see if there's a future, like and the future might just be a second date. Right. You should you should do that because otherwise you're just kind of wasting time and energy and money and everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think what a lot of people fall prey of is trauma bonding on mm. like a on a first date of like because I, I I've done it myself where like you connect over a traumatic experience that you've both have shared and like I've talked to my therapist about this and it's like trauma bonding could be where the person inflicts the trauma on you like a narcissist and that's the bond but you can also bond with other people over shared traumas that might not have been inflicted about that person and I think often that is where the hiccups start to come in because you are first of all being very vulnerable. You're sharing a lot like on a first date do I want to talk about my dad hitting us as kids? No yeah. I don't I don't. It's not sexy. It's not fun. I don't that that shit doesn't make me who I am. I have my own personality and quirks and things like that. That's just part of the story that created this version of who I am and spit it out 32 years later. But do I want to tell some because also what people forget is like what you tell that other person, they could use that against you. You don't know who the fuck that person is. And if they're manipulative or if they are a, a chatty Cathy or if I've had that where I've said something and they, they told someone else and you're like, now that's inappropriate. Mm hmm. Yeah. So why would you share such intimate details on a first date? A first date needs to be light and airy and fun and laughing. And like, it should just be like you said, I want to see this person again. I, I liked myself around them. Yeah. And that's, I think, I think that it, it kind of goes along with like, let's say you do that for an hour, right? And not to put a time limit, I'm just saying the first hour is great. Second hour is great. And like, it keeps going. And then you, then you just start getting down some deeper, you know, like rabbit holes and, and about personal stuff. I think if that stuff comes out, like I said, naturally, I think it's okay. But like you said, like you have certain things you may want to reserve and you probably shouldn't share on a first date and maybe not even until you really know a person. But but I think it's okay to get deep on certain things as long as you are comfortable with sharing them. And, and I always think like if you have a secret, like if you tell, at least before you really know somebody and you're like a true partner or whatever, like if you tell one person everyone can find out like yeah. it, I wouldn't tell anybody anything unless you're comfortable with right a lot with of everyone people knowing, knowing yeah. it I mean I think and there's also like to that point I think there's also a way that you can divert conversation so like if you're talking and you're like if somebody says you know I got that question like well, what do how do I say it and it's like if somebody asks you about something that you don't want to share on the first date like I don't want to talk about my dad or anything it's just you know, oh, tell me about your parents. What's your relationship? Yeah, we have a contentious relationship, I think, like any other family dynamic. And it's something I'll share with you when I feel more comfortable over time. I don't see anybody being like, I would never. It's like I if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, wow, that's a that's a really healthy boundary. That's yeah. really hot. And it's boundaries are really difficult for people because they're so scared of if they don't share it and if they don't do something to connect with that person, that they're never going to see that person again. But that's again, that trauma bond. And you're not actually bonding with that person because you have a beautiful connection. You're bonding with that person because you feel seen, heard, heard and understood for something that your therapist should be helping you through, right, right. not the person that you're getting a drink with. Yeah. Okay. So what are some, what are maybe the most common things that you run into with clients? Or just things maybe see on like TikTok comments and like what do people usually resonate with the most? Re like in the, what do they resonate with? Yeah. Like, or um, things that people, you know, experience dating and, and relationships. Are I there think com more common threads. Yeah. I mean, I think what I found as far as like the chord that strikes really well, it's like, there's the click, there's the bait that people take when you talk about texting that always resonates with people of like, and that just gets a conversation going. But I think what actually, like what I saw the, the posts that do the best at least is like when I give very shared personal experience of how anxiety affected my life and my dating life and then the steps I took to overcome it because it's as somebody who experienced it like that's why I know when people are like I feel so seen oh my god you get me I'm like I get you because I was you yeah. I know every single fucking thought process you're having I know every feeling I know exactly how your body feels and I know where your thoughts are going right now because I have lived this for 32 years so that is something that I feel like I see it a lot. It breaks my heart a lot too. And especially, I mean, some of the questions I get, I literally want to just hug them. Cause I'm like, if you think this is remotely healthy of like, Oh, this guy ghosted me four times and keeps coming back. And like, sometimes a harsh reality will come where I'm like, stop fucking allowing it. And then I have to pull back and be like, all right, don't be an asshole. You know, like yeah. these people don't know better, <laughs> but I think it's this, the attachment styles are still really new for a lot of people. Understanding anxiety is still really new. Same with avoidance. Like avoidance gets such a bad rep. I don't know. See, where do you fall? 
I would say honestly, at this point in my life, I'm probably like 75% secure, 25% avoidant. Okay. So you were, but you were avoidant dominant at one point probably. and then leaning in. Yeah. So I'm like anxious going into secure. And I think because anxiety is so outward, that's that perception of, well, you express yourself, you're getting it out. At least that's the healthy thing where it's like, no, 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 no. Anxious attachment is equally as unhealthy as avoidant. It's just manifested differently. And I'm always trying to get people with anxiety to understand what avoidance are going through. Because if you don't have compassion, why would they have compassion for you if you can't see how they're feeling? Right. And so I'm sure you can relate of like, oh, avoidance don't feel. It's like, no, they just internalize it differently. Yeah. Literally, it's manifested where you go out, they go in. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think the hottest topic that we can talk about all fucking day is like just of attachment styles, narcissist, everyone's a narcissist, everybody. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't, it, trust me, you don't actually know what that means until you've dated or lived with somebody that is. It's, it's crazy though. It's how like crazy. that stuff, like, because it's just out there, it just gets reinforced into society and becomes yeah. like, it becomes real. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. Well, I think with attachment styles, it's a beautiful thing to explore, to understand yourself more, but people attach to their attachment styles. Mm. And it's almost like a badge of honor of like, well, I'm anxious. And it's like, well, why should somebody have to accept that? Is that an explanation or an excuse? Right. If it's an explanation for your behavior, well, great. And what are the actionable steps that you're taking to, to fix that and to work on that? And what therapy and what are you doing? If it's an excuse, I don't have the patience for excuses because you just want everyone to accept you, but you don't want to accept anybody else. Yeah, it does. It becomes an identity and it becomes like, um, like a self-fulfilling prophecy moving mm -hmm. forward and, and, yeah, it's, it's bad. It's bad news. Yeah. And it's like, do I think anybody, do I think that if you suffer from anxiety or avoidance that you can become a hundred percent secure? No, I don't think that it's curable. I think you're always going to have that because you're not getting rid of that little child inside of you. So they're always going to have those moments that flare up. But do I think you can get control of it? Yes. But in the, I would probably say the number one question I get is, well, how do I make it go away? And mm -hmm. it's like, you're not going to like my answer. It's a lot of fucking work. Do the work is implied because it's so much and it's daily. That's like saying, I want a six pack. All right. Well, I can tell you how to get it. Are you going to do it every single day? Are you going to go back every day? Are you going to show up? Are you going to remind yourself every time you're going to grab for the Cheetos that you want that six pack? And you, it's the same with your thought process. The inner fat kid is always there. Always there. Yeah. Just like the inner anxious and the inner Gotta avoidant. Keep them at bay. It's about, and it's about reparenting them. Like, Hey, you don't need that. I'm here now. You're good. Yeah. And so it's like, I don't have any quick fix. I, if I were to say how you could heal your anxiety, it's like, mm, it's going to take a lot of work on your part and it's constant. And that's why I think people are just like, yeah, I don't want to do it. Right. So obviously attached is a big influence for you, right? Yeah. It's just the book. Yeah. The book and the, the, like the theories behind it. And I think it's, I think it is, it's a big part in the sense where it, it allows you to at least not feel crazy anymore for not understanding your behavior. It's an explanation. Yeah. And that's what I love. But I always tell people, I'm like, attached is the first start. I was gonna, yeah, I was going to ask, like, I guess that's kind of a gateway. That's the gateway. What, el what other resources do you think or books or whatever do you think are good for you know, like a next step? I mean, that? if you want to take this shit seriously, like for me, I was like, I read attached. Okay, cool. I had an awareness, but therapy. I mean, like, mm -hmm. unless you have somebody that is really going to call you on your shit and help you work through those, how are you going to fucking do it? You could read every book under the sun, but if you don't have the self-awareness or the way to connect it, I'm just giving you tools for the toolbox that you don't, it's like coming you a different language. So I think it's like, that's a great place to start some identity and like some self-awareness. If you, if your shit wasn't that bad and you're kind of like, well, I'm pretty secure, but sometimes I lean a little left or a little right. Sure. You can read attached. And there's like another attached attachment book. My friend gave me, you could read Jay Shetty's new book, eight rules of love. You could read the four agreements fine. You can meditate and you can understand how to sit in your thoughts and remove yourself from the emotions and do all that. But if you were severe anxiety or severe avoidance, nothing is going to make that go away until you address the inner child shit or wherever, wherever you learned along the way that those core beliefs were instilled. Mm -hmm. So for anxious, where did you learn that you're not worthy? Where did you learn that you're not good enough? Where did you learn that you're too big? Where did you learn you're too much? Who taught you all that? And that's going back and being like, oh, I have to go back to some really uncomfortable shit and remind myself, yeah, my dad used to say that. My dad used to do this and thus it made me, it made me believe that I wasn't good enough. Right. And then you've given that inner child a light to speak and then you can go back and be like, yeah, but I'm here now and I'm good. And that's the work every day of having to stop yourself. And then it becomes like a, a muscle that you work. Mm -hmm. So do you have tips on finding the right therapist for you? 
So I personally use BetterHelp because I like the platform structure and I like that you can bop between therapists. It's not a plug, by no, the way. No, it's not, but it should be if they're listening. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I like the app because I've tried a few. Um, I mean, it's hit or miss. Like I've had, I had therapy prior to that, like from through insurance and I think I coasted for most of it. Like it, therapy is only as good as the work that you're putting into it. Mm -hmm. But these therapists were like, they kicked my ass. Like they really were like, oh no, we're going to do this. And I did tapping and then I did, I did ketamine treatments. Ketamine treatments were fucking game changing for me. Um, but I like BetterHelp because you answer a questionnaire and then it matches you with people. You have a biography, you can read about them, you can see their qualifications. And then if you don't like them, so you have a session and you're like, did not resonate with her, you just press change therapist and it goes you 20 new ones. Is that done all... Online or? Uh -huh. Okay. How Which, much does it cost? I want to say, I'm not, I'm grandfathered in because I've been with them for like five years. I, th I want to say it's like 45 a session, mm. but then they have financial aid, which is huge. And so you can financial aid that shit. And I think you can get it down to like 30 bucks a session. Nice. And the, but the best part is though, you get the texting in between your sessions. Ah. So like what I use is like, if you're having a moment and you text your therapist, sometimes they can get back to you. But what's really important is it's being able to log the thought processes to then go, okay, when I go to my next session, my therapist would be like, I noticed you went first to attacking yourself. And then you said this and you can under, cause after you're like, oh, I'm fine now. Yeah. You forget like all that transpired on that conversation. But when you're in that moment and you're texting somebody, it's like a lifeline. You can then follow that and like, be able to work on that in your next session. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, like fitness, right? You have a trainer, you're only with them for three weeks, three hours a week, four hours a week. Sometimes it's what do you do the rest of the time and how do you reinforce the good habits and behaviors that are going to help you actually, you know, change and hit your goals and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think like for me doing fitness and health, it took me like, you know, now that I'm lifting and doing that consistently, yeah, it took me a while to understand, like, you got to show up every day. You got to eat your protein. If you want a bigger butt, you got to lift, you got to do your squat. Like these are things you have to do every single fucking day, yeah. day in and day out. That's exactly. the only way of like, you can have a beautiful external, but if your internal shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you do a lot of work with, uh, cause the woman I mentioned earlier, Amy Noble, she actually will go on dating apps with her clients and you know read the messages and, and kind of help them work through like all these things so that whoever's messaging these people like they're dealing with her too which is interesting but do you ever do any stuff on dating apps i haven't yet so actually something that's exciting that i'm i'm allowed to share a little bit of this information but i can't give any like details on it but i am going to be with along with another co-host um experts on a dating show nice. and it's yeah so that's coming out like that's we're in pre-production right now so we're still like gonna we're still trying to find all the daters and everything which we'll eventually get to but the concept is we're going to be working with people from 20 to 80 that are fatigued tired of dating either burned out new to it I've, i just got out of a divorce whatever help them like through the process of like let's identify what your issues are let's talk about it let's give some tough love we're going to have a therapist there as well to deal with the deeper issues that me and my co-host can't handle, but it will include like dating app makeovers and understanding like what foot are you putting forward? What do your prompts say? What are your photos saying about you? Because you can't be surprised with what you're getting back on the dating apps with depending on what you're putting out there. Right. So if you're wondering why you're always getting dudes that are trying to hook up with you, it's like, well, stop putting seven bikini photos on your fucking thing. I, I, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Like you're, what you're utilizing to get somebody is what they're going to come after you for. So if you're a dude and you're using your money, can't be surprised that a girl's after your money for you. Right. So I'm excited to be able to work with people. Like I think we're gonna have anything five to eight daters, and it's nice. gonna be like an intensive boot camp for a month, and it's gonna be a docu series to follow along on their journey and kind of really understand like where are their core issues, what's their deals, and what's holding them back from like finding somebody. But then at the same time, also understanding that like I'm not God. I can't tell you how to get a guy. I can't tell you how to keep a guy, but I can tell you how to stay more sane while you're trying to do it. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Congratulations on that. Thank too. You. Sound, that sounds super exciting. I'm stoked. I'm very yeah. excited. So, I mean, obviously we'll be talking about first rounds on me and be Thank getting you. people to join the app, depending on the city that they're in. Thank you. But yeah. Um, so what would you say, like from a, from a woman's perspective, the do's and don'ts for guys on their dating app profiles? Ugh. Please stop putting fish photos. Like stop putting. You know, it's funny. We make some, you know, content about that and people get offended. People that live in the South I know. get offended about get like offended. the anti fish pics. And it's more of like, for me, it's like, stop with the, first of all, don't put photos of you from like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Put current photos. I see so many dudes where it's like them surfing, them hiking. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. That's great. You can put that in your interest. Um, to make sure like glasses are off. Don't hat fish people. 
Don't like, if you don't have the hair, show that you don't have the hair. Like do not make somebody figure it out or don't put too many group photos. Don't make me scroll to the end to find out that you're not the cute one in the photo. Hmm. Um, and then the prompts, like, can you have something to say? St if I see one more, like I'll trip for you if you fall, if I'll fall for you if you trip me. The best way to ask me out is to ask me out. It's like, are you, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like what's the, where's the creativity here and what's gonna make me wanna talk to you? Show your personality. Um, or the worst idea I've ever had joining this app. It's like, that doesn't make anybody... That self-deprecating, making yeah. fun of yourself isn't hot when you're trying to. Also, if you reuse a line, that's just a common line. That's like, I'd rather have you say something boring. That's not, that's your own original thought. Leave it blank. Yeah. I'd rather you not fucking answer. But I think that is just like, actually put who you are out there so that you stop getting disappointed when people don't like the real version of you once they get to meet you. Yeah. You're not, but it's the same with girls. It's like, stop with the filters and the this and the half photos. It's like, or the neck up. It's like, if you have a body type that you're not proud of, start, work on that first before you try to trick people. And then they go out and then you get upset. Well, you're fat. It's like, no, 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 nobody's doing that. You're just not putting your foot forward and sharing what you are. You can't be surprised that somebody might not be interested in you. Yeah. So I think it's like, be as authentic as you possibly can. And that was mine. Like my hinge profile, I had very strategic photos of like full body, smiling. I didn't have any rusting bitch face on there. I had ones of me working out. So you could see that. I had ones always in fitness clothes. I'm like, let's manage expectations of what you're going to get. Like very minimal. And then like my prompts were like looking for someone driven by growth and like vulnerable and, and wanting to like become the best version of themselves. Then I had a funny one of like eat dinner to get to dessert. Like snacks are always a must. Okay, cool. You can talk about that. Sign of a great first date. It actually happens. And you can be like, aha, let's make this happen. I gave enough touch points on the profile to where somebody with a sense of humor or somebody who gets picking up what I'm putting down is going to go for it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, cool. Um, we are trying to do a couple new segments and we're working working on them, but we'll start with a couple of rapid fire questions. Okay, let's go. And then I'll circle back to a couple of recurring questions. But okay. you can say pass if you want to. Okay. Uh, we only have like seven or eight, but all right. Favorite drink? I think we established Cloud's the Cloud's movie. Okay. <laughs> or water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite date spot? Ooh. Oh, they closed. But I used to love... Um, okay, in New York, Ivan Ramen. In LA, I used to love um, Next Door to Butcher's Daughter. Only the Wild Ones. Ooh. It was a cute place. And then okay. they closed. Cool. Uh, you may hate these, but favorite <laughs> rom-com? Oh, fuck. <laughs> um, this is not a rom-com. My favorite movie is Eternal Sunshine. Okay. In a weird way, it's okay, a... It's I, a yeah. It's not a rom-com, but it's a romantic. It's a real, yeah, it's real. Yeah, it's sad. Okay. Uh, Go-to karaoke song? Um, Fiona Apple, Criminal. Nice. Favorite curse word? Fuck. Definitely, okay. <laughs> uh, celebrity crush? Ooh, Ryan Reynolds. Ooh. Yeah, real original. <laughs> Love language? Uh, I would say physical touch in conjunction with um, acts of service. Well, to give or receive. Uh, to receive. To receive? Oh, to receive. Um, yeah, physical touch, acts of service. Those and are huge. to give? Me. Same. Okay. Um, favorite sex position? Ooh. Um, flat on the stomach with a dude from behind. Mm. Yeah, I like that one nice. a lot. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay. That's all we got right now. Okay. Um, thank fun. you. Thank you. Of uh, let's see. I wanted to ask you, okay, so what does love mean to you? Interesting question. Growing up, my mom made it very clear of like, you don't tell everybody. You know, like when people like love you and you're like, no, you don't know me. Mm -hmm. So to me, love is accepting somebody fully for who they are and meeting them where they are and just all encompassing having an, a complete acceptance for somebody and an admiration for them in that regard. Cause I don't say I love you very easily. So like, if I say I love you, it's like, I fucking love every, I, and there's not a part of you that I'd want to change as who you are. Interesting. So I just accept that person. And that's what makes me love them for who they are is like an authentic real version of a person that makes me fall in love with them. Love that. Okay, cool. Um, what are the most important things for a healthy, successful, happy, long-term relationship? Communication. Times seven. <laughs> Communication is like the most important aspect. Um, vulnerability, honesty, like honesty is kindness and having those hard conversations is only going to help that relationship grow. Um, and I think as a a focus on personal development because I think if you want to be a great couple, you need to be a great version of yourself and then both show up to be a great couple. Mm. So it's not about somebody else fixing you. It's not about you having stuff and putting it under the rug. So I think if you communicate, if you have vulnerability and you are working on yourself in conjunction to working on the relationship, I can't see that. Like it's like unstoppable at that point. Mm. If it also compatibility, 
Do you both have the same alignment? Do you both have the same goals? Do you both see things the same? Do you both, I mean, I think COVID taught us that too. Like imagine being stuck in quarantine with half these people, wherever they fall, vax, no vax, this, that, the other, I don't give a shit where you fall, I don't care. Compatibility means more than just what's your favorite color and do we like the same music? Yeah, very true. Yeah, yeah there's so many things. I think, cause a lot of times too, like we, we talked about Hollywood movies, you talked about fairy tales. I think a lot of times we, you can fall into the trap of like, it, everything's just supposed to happen and oh, it's, yeah. fe- it's all feelings. But when you really want a relationship to work, there's so many like logical things you have to think about and mm-hmm. work on. And, and none of almost the feeling stuff almost doesn't matter. No. Right. And maybe like for the initial, like getting things going, but like, it's all like, you have to do all this stuff and you have to figure yeah. out what works. It's, it's, you know, it, I didn't really think about stuff like that until like the past couple of years. And it's also, it's important to understand that like, if you want somebody to be the best version and you're going to call them out and all that, it's like, you also need to create a safe space that they could do the same for you. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to dish it out, you have to also be able to take that feedback and understand you're not perfect. Like we talked about earlier, you are not this perfect princess that has no issues and everybody else is the issue. It's like anytime if I'm dating somebody and I have like, if we're going to have a conversation, I'll always touch base of like, is there anything that you want to talk to me about? And I create a safe space to be like, okay, thank you for letting me know like this is really important for me to understand where your thought process is so that they feel comfortable to continue that. Yeah. Like, otherwise, it's like, that's what I said, it, nothing in life is easy. So why the fuck would a relationship be? It takes a lot of work, but with the work comes the most beautiful connection that you could ever possibly imagine and you're truly your best friend. Yeah. Amazing. Definitely. Um, okay. What? Let's see. Um Okay, this is kind of a selfish question. <laughs> uh, I, I like to ask this question because it's something I think about for relationships for myself. Um, would you ever consider having separate bedrooms? I've thought about this myself as well. I am not opposed to it. I, I mean, I've, I dated a dude once and he was like, I want to live like Frida and have separate homes. And I was like, okay, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, separate homes and now, now we're pushing it. I don't personally think having two bedrooms, like you can sleep together if you want. I get shit sleep next to somebody. I mm-hmm. do. And like, I like my space. I like my closet. I like to have my stuff. I like the girly stuff. Like I'm not opposed to it. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to start a movement. So. Are you? Yeah. Are we if, pro? If you want. I'm so pro. Pro two bedrooms. But it's not a deal breaker. But I even say like, I'll take like a a closet like yeah. with maybe a small window, but like just give me a little <laughs> twin bed. She could have a king and we'll- yeah, Anything. Just but that's, and I, I also think a lot about this too, because that's where like- uh, honesty and trust comes in, right? Because yeah. like, if we sleep together in the same bed two nights in a row, and then the next night I'm like, I want to go sleep by myself. She has to be like, okay, he just wants to sleep by himself, right? And knows that I'm being honest, and there's no weird shit going on, and uh, she has nothing to worry about. So I think that's where the trust and communication. Oh, comes that's back. <laughs> goes back. Sorry, when you ask, what's the most important thing? Parts of like a relationship, trust. If you don't trust your partner, the fuck are you doing? No yeah. idea why you're in a relationship with that person because you can't have any you can't have any kinds of relationship in life if you don't trust them because you're always you're always anticipating that they're going to hurt you. Mm-hmm. And it's the same, like you said, it's like yeah, I want to know that if you're going in the other room, I'm not like, well, are you texting somebody and why? Are... Yeah. So I never really thought about this, but do you think trust? Do you do you start with trust, giving someone complete trust, or do they have to earn it first? I'm going in. I go into it as you're guilty. And, you're innocent until proven guilty. You have to earn my trust over time. I would be a, a schmuck if I just like gave it off the right. bat. But I think a lot of people enter guilty until proven innocent. And it's like, no, 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 not everyone's trying to hurt you. So I try not to project my old shit onto other people. I try not to bring the past stuff into my next relationship. But I don't think it's like an automatic, but I think it's a clean slate. Mm-hmm. If you start to go up, great, you've earned my trust and everything's good. But if there's starting to be those things, like if you say, if you and I are dating and you said, I'm going to call you in an hour and you kept not calling me, I wouldn't trust you after that. Then I wouldn't trust your word and things like that. You yeah. start chipping away and that's where you start going, well, will you? And then the micromanaging. But if you said, I'm going to call you in an hour and you called me in an hour, I'd be like, eh, all right. Yeah. He's done nothing to make me think otherwise. Exactly. Um, hmm. I, how did you, I wanted to ask how exactly what made you get started on TikTok and how did you like, where was the, you know, first post happened and then you just like, it snowballed from there. It seemed like, I mean, my, so my friend Daria, shout out to my home girl. What um, Daria? What's up Daria? Daria and my friend Jackie, my friend Jackie was actually in town and she was TikToking and she was like, I'm telling you, you'd be so good at this. You'd give such good advice and da da da. And we started kind of doing it on Insta summer of 2021. When I first moved to LA, we would do like red dealer, well, like a um, red flag or deal breaker. And we were starting and people were really resonating. And Daria's like, I'm telling you, dude, you should do this. 
I had my own limiting beliefs as to like, nobody cares about me. Nobody wants to hear me talk. I'm alone on this island. Nobody's going to understand me. And I think the first post I made that like blew, like what started to grow was when I had my very, like, I was like, these are the, what, this is the problem with dating. And it was this post I'd made of like all the dating apps and what their issues were with them. And then that's when I was like, huh, maybe I'm onto something. It took me like a month of TikTok to get away from the trolls. Cause I had one post that went viral and people literally like what I learned about TikTok is they create what they want to create based off your post. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking about a dude that I had been dating and saying that we had slept together. We'd been dating for two months. People took it. And then I said, like it changed when we had the talk about like us being more serious, circumstances changed. He wasn't ready to do it. He was not over his ex, whatever. Fine. I don't give a shit. And I was just sharing that like, you know, oftentimes when circumstances change, that's why somebody might not want to be with you. Mm -hmm. People took the fact that I had said we had hooked up the night before and I said then the next day we had our conversation and they ran with it. This girl, what a fucking idiot. This is the first time they hooked up. I'm like, I did. <laughs> but I didn't say that. Right. That taught me about it. I was like, okay, you got to find your audience and figure it out. It's now been, what, five months? And we're at almost 200,000 followers. So I'm like, amazing. it's going well. The people are, we're having a good time. What's up to everybody in the land of yeah. TikTok? We're having a good time. But there's still those people that you're like, ugh. But yeah, I, I stayed really consistent though. And I found my voice. I figured mm -hmm. out what people want to hear from me. And then I work with it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, congrats yeah. on that. Yeah, Appreciate super cool. It. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to wrap soon because we've okay. probably been going for a little over an hour. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, Anyth everybody. <laughs> no, nah, this has been awesome. You've been great. Uh, anything else you want to touch on or? No, I mean, I think we touched on everything. I think it's at the end of the day, it's like to daters out there, it's like just start becoming a better buyer. Mm. And like work on yourself. Stop fucking waiting for everybody else to make things better for you in life when that's just not what it's going to happen. And you're going to have to create that. And then enjoy the dating process. Like, let's have some fun. Yes. No one's saying we have to have fun where it's like you have to sleep with every person that you go on. But like, try to find the fun. It's either, either try to find the fun of it and stop complaining or don't fucking date and stop complaining. But you can't keep putting yourself out there and keep complaining because nobody wants to hear it anymore. Yeah. yeah. We're all in this together. Yes. Well said. Thanks, man. All right. Uh, well, where can people find you? We'll link it in the show notes, but. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, shout it all out. Shout it all out. So we got Sabrina Zohar, Sabrina.Zohar on Insta and TikTok. Do the Work Podcast is just that. It's called Do the Work Podcast. Um, and then my company is called Software. So wearsoftware.com. Amazing. Yeah. All right, Sabrina, thank you so much. Of course. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you.